into a bit of what the NUS FinTech SG program is all about. And then we also have our online assessment, your interview, and sign up for the course. So if you've come here today to sign up for the course, you're in the right place. If you've come to learn a little bit more and decide whether you'd like to, and you might stay around to sign up, great. That's wonderful too. So we'll be looking forward to discussing further with you today. What happened? In Singapore, we've seen, and around the world, COVID-19 really took a great toll on businesses, companies, and more. Whole sectors have been impacted. But at the same time, the Economic Development Board was bringing in new companies like Zoom, Tencent, Alibaba, and more into Singapore to place their headquarters here. And so even though there's this uncertain environment, companies were coming here to Singapore. And in fact, the World Economic Forum highlighted back in 2017 that 30% of workers would need to be reskilled by 2025, 30% of all the world's workers. In 2020, last October, the World Economic Forum revised their update. They said, look, it's actually going to take 50% of the workers that are going to need to be reskilled. And not long after that, the Singapore government highlighted, well, we're going to need a million workers in digital. And you've seen it. COVID-19 caused us all to go to e-commerce. Remember the lockdown last year? Uh, we couldn't even get outside. Those businesses that were interested and had already moved to digital or were fast to, were able to capture the market quickly. Grab, for example, the Grab Taxi uh, Corporation, you know, they did transform quite a few businesses and attack the market in a big way. Redmart put a lot of pressure on fair price to finally make deliveries to everyone's home as opposed to having to go directly. This requires people to take the skills that they've learned over time and convert them to be digital. Ravi Menon went further and he said, there's a mismatch between the demand and supply of technology workers. He stated, there are simply not enough Singaporeans applying for tech roles. The problem is not the jobs, it's the skills. Well, this was a big statement and it was made back in May. And I just wanna stop here for a moment. Certainly this has been very much highlighted in this week's parliamentary debates. What are the skill gaps? What is it that is causing a situation where people are underemployed, not able to get into certain positions and more? It's not an easy answer, but last year we started to work on something so that we could establish a connection so that we could bridge the skill gaps that had been highlighted. Of course, why are we surprised that there's a difference in skills? 20 years ago, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, they weren't the top and largest companies in the world. They were not. Remember, it was General Electric. It was Walmart. It was Citibank. Those were the top companies, and they needed traditional skills. 20 years later, today, the top five companies largest in the world are companies that don't manufacture anything. Facebook, Google, Amazon. Microsoft, and on the Chinese side, Alibaba. These are organizations that have a whole new requirement for skills, and they grow by thousands of people just in Singapore alone. The banks and other organizations are following along too. And so we launched the NUS FinTech SG program. We launched it out of the need in order to upskill new grads and also mid-career. We recognized and heard from businesses and governments, not just in Singapore, but around the world, who said that, can we continue to build this, the Singapore ecosystem? Did you know that the Singapore FinTech Association back in 2017 was just a few hundred companies? Now, it's over several thousand. Several thousand looking for talent, looking for people. And they were coming to us at the, at the university and saying, you're only graduating a thousand people a year uh, in computer science. Can we do this fast? 
We want to also enable fintech transformation in businesses, as well as to allow companies to establish the new fintech organizations as well. The goal, set up a good hands-on course where people can get confident about what it means to do fintech. And so we were written up in the Business Times for uh, ability to try to uh, reduce the supply crunch. Why come to NUS? Well, I know that you all know the National University of Singapore is a very, very good school. But I also want to highlight the School of Computing. We're number four in the world, not very often mentioned in the newspaper. Just behind MIT, Stanford, and Carnegie Mellon, but ahead of my alma mater, which is Cornell, and also ahead of Berkeley and Oxford, Harvard computer science departments as well. So something that you should all feel very proud of, but also you should have great confidence in coming to, to work with us here. School of Computing also not only looks at teaching, but also deep tech research, which is our crystal center. My fellow uh, colleague and who I'm co-director with of the Crystal Center, we said, how do we get a great and detailed discussion going around blockchain and algorithms and security? And the FinTech Lab, which helped develop this course, uh, will look at experiential education. How do we help people really feel and touch what FinTech is all about so they can have their lives transformed safely? And we wanted to educate the ecosystem, the lawyers, the regulators, and more. And Professor Mohan Kankanali, who's the dean, said, listen, as digitalization becomes an essential anchor for our economy, it's crucial to provide companies with a foundation, especially future ready talent. Are you ready? Let me share some more. The advisors to the FinTech SG program span the gamut from organizations like the World Economic Forum, Monetary Authority of Singapore, the largest wealth management company in the world, bank, UBS, but also to small startups, recent graduates, because we didn't want to conflict with what they had learned, and also to confirm what else they needed to know, as well as venture capitalists who said, when we hire people, this is what we're looking for. So we had a well-rounded set of advisors who continue to share with us how the market's changing. And in FinTech, you can never stay still. This is about lifelong learning, and even your professors continue to do lifelong learning, adjusting the course so it meets the needs of the companies and also to enable you to perhaps start your own company. We were really happy last year. Every time we run the, this type of session, people ask, how many people got jobs? What type of roles are they going into? Well, stay tuned. Let me share a few of that with you. In our very first batch, we were very excited. We had people coming in from the business school, from arts and social sciences, from engineering even, who were struggling to get jobs because of COVID-19, had disrupted the airline industry, had disrupted retail and more. And so these folks here were able to get 100% higher, whether it was with Visa, MasterCard and other organizations that after having taken the program, were able to jump in. Uh, one young man had dreamed about joining a FinTech. His friends were all joining it from School of Computing, but he wasn't from School of Computing. He wondered how he would get there, and he made it there. One big aspect of our program is that you're not coming here just to learn. Uh, that's nice, it's great for you to learn, but you're also coming here because you want to do something else, or at least that's what we hope is the case. You want to perhaps get a career in FinTech or you want to enhance the work that you do at your current job. Wonderful. The eSpeed interview, which we run, is where we've changed the paradigm. People come in, like yourselves, to the program. They learn. Then you get exposed to what does it mean to do the theory of this FinTech, the actual programming, let's deploy it in smart contracts and more. Now you're ready to interview. Many of you probably have sent out resumes or so in this field, or perhaps even were concerned about sending your resume out. The eSpeed interview is different. The companies come and they provide their job descriptions to us. 
graduates of the program get to look at the job descriptions and say, huh, am I interested in interviewing for this? And you get an interview. The employer doesn't look at your resume because they know that, that you've come through our program. And if you've made it, then you're ready to be with one of them. So it's flipped. Normally you send a resume and you hope for a job interview. eSpeed is the, and by the way, the market is so hot, this is the way it is. Companies give us their job descriptions and they hope that you'll interview. That's quite a big difference. People have said from the interview, Prof Keith and other colleagues, listen, you know, I hadn't even, you know, thought about interviewing for some of these types of jobs because I wasn't familiar with the terminology. I wasn't confident I could actually show up well in the interview. And now having come through the course, I do feel like I can take on the job and also get through the interview. That's great to hear. That's exactly what we want to know. And so these folks here were able to achieve that. This information is all here. I'll put it into the chat for you as well if you wanted to learn more about it. We're really proud of our graduates. They've worked very hard and they've learned about collaboration, how to work together. And we've seen more than 160 job placements now as well. Everything from the banking and finance industry to user experience design and more. This is really nice because people come into the program. Some of them know what they're thinking about doing, some maybe not. They learn and then they are ready to get out there into the market. There's different aspects of FinTech and this is really important. We expect people to either go into business roles or technical roles. Some of the business roles that people go into are adoption change management, automation engineer, and more, business analysts. Certainly your project managers, maybe with an upgrade to agile project management, scrum, and new methodologies. But people also get interested, huh, I didn't really know about programming before, now I love it. Let me go and do front end and back end programming, database engineering, and more. Maybe you find out through the course, hmm, I never did like programming and I still don't. Okay, and this is why we have two outcomes. And I'll just stop sharing for a moment here. See this device, this phone. You can't just be a programmer to develop things for. It. There's no way. We won't, love, we won't like it if it doesn't work well, isn't fast, explanation's not clear. You have to have multi disciplines in order to deliver an app, in order to make a FinTech, in order to do anything, even with artificial intelligence. Think about it. Let's say you wanna build an app. Well, first you need a business problem. Then you need to understand the customer. You need design thinking to make it look great and meet the customer's needs. Then you need to actually go and see what's the business process gonna look like? How much will we make? What's the cost? I haven't said anything about technology yet. Finally, you get the specifications ready and you talk about front end, back end development. Those type of roles come into play. Once you get that first prototype ready, you bring it back to the customer, back to the business, back to marketing, sales. All those roles need to understand FinTech these days. They need to understand the new technology, but they don't all have to be programmers. So there's a beginning, which is all about business and capability and analyst type work. There's the middle, which is the programming and delivery. And then there's the end, which is again, bringing it into the marketplace and making it come to life, which again is your business roles. The skills that you already have are very, very valuable in the FinTech industry. It's just a matter of adding more capability in, understanding of the terminologies, et cetera. So you might say, Prof Carter, you know, what are you talking about? What, are there really that many jobs? You've highlighted a few different ones. What's going on? I always like to, during these information sessions, update this. So we did this analysis last year, 11,000 jobs were open. And so let's go to LinkedIn directly. If I go over into LinkedIn and I look at jobs right now, and let's take a look, there's 600 new technology jobs. Well, how many technology jobs are there? 16,000 right now. 
Well, what type of experience levels are they? Everything from entry level, associate, executive, and they do all different types of things. You know, VP at a bank, everyone is called a VP at a bank. Then there's assistant vice president and more. These are roles that are out there that people can jump into. And let's take a look at the last month. You might say, well, Keith, maybe 11,000 positions posted just in the last month in technology. These are open positions and they're not cheap to post. It costs about $700 for every post on LinkedIn. Can you imagine how these companies are going to the market and fighting in the war for talent? We're trying to teach as many people as we can so that they can go into these roles. We're expecting that people come from all different backgrounds, design, engineering, and more, because that background is what people also need to have. Like I said, in terms of designing an app, it's not just merely computing. Computing is great. If you have a computing background, that will really help you a lot in the course. But other backgrounds are just as important. Let me give an example. Pei Wen, she came through our program and originally was working in the back office and front office of a bank. She did relationship management. After the program, she went off and became a country manager at Raffles Care. This is a med tech startup that has a app that they're doing and transforming the way healthcare is not just in Singapore, but Raffles is an international company. Uh, so around the uh, Asia region, really exciting. And really excited to see her you know, with her three kids, you know, go through the program, put in effort, move from banking background, et cetera, all the way into really fun tech and operations. That's a mid-career person. For those of you who are just graduating, you've, we've also seen people like Jaylin. She came through from Faculty of Arts and now is a product designer doing digital product design. Ismail came from engineering and is now doing full stack development at a bank. Really cool to see these type of transformations happen right in front of our very eyes as well. I'll touch on the cost here for it because it's always something that people ask very quickly uh, with no government support, it's about $18,000. But if you are a fresh grad coming out of NUS, it can be $0 because NUS provides a top up uh, for uh, the expense that you have. If you're 40 years old or older, uh, well, great, we, we're friends, we're in the same uh, bracket, it's about $2,000. Uh, if you're younger, great, but that's about 5,500 for you. You can take a screenshot if you wanna remember this. Also, it's on one of the websites May will share with you. So the structure, what does it look like? Well, in the first instance, we go through and we share the concepts. What is FinTech about? What's all these non-fungible tokens and other things we've been hearing about? And then we have you hop right in and do some hands-on technology work by doing design thinking and an app prototype. So before you're just a few weeks in, you've already developed an app yourself. That's pretty cool. And by the way, hundreds of people before you have been able to do this successfully. It's exciting to see. And it's a lot of fun. You also use the data-driven lean canvas and other types of tools in order to investigate in the environment, understand what's happening and how you can even take it further ahead. Then you go through your development of programming, understanding project management, delivering on application programming interfaces. You get to create your first robot. You get to do algo trading and more. And then ultimately we have the e-speed interview if you want, to, if you haven't yet gotten a full-time position. So the course plan looks like this. We go through our FinTech concepts, design thinking, which is really fun, beyond disruptions and delight customers. These are where you're getting to understand the lay of the land. What's out there? What can I do? Where have people failed? How have they succeeded? You also get to go through your front end and back end development. 
you're learning JavaScript here, you're learning structured query language and NoSQL here, application program interface where you're actually making calls and having things happen in the cloud, robotic process automation, which is truly the important artificial intelligence today. If you love Expedia, if you love booking airline tickets automatically, that's robotic process automation. You get to make your own robot here. You'll get to learn about DevOps, which is where you put things into the cloud. You're gonna scale from what you've learned on programming and scale it so that it can be a global program. Then we get you into smart contracts. What is a contract? How does it become smart using blockchain? And you get to program it. And ultimately, algo trading. This is one of the courses that everyone has a lot of fun with. You learn how to do investing and trading. And then you get the, the computer to do the investing and trading for you. Really awesome course. And this is where you learn some Python as well. So you learn multiple languages, multiple businesses, multiple technologies through the whole program. In addition though, this is not just about how can we develop new code or you know, school computing type stuff. We also need you to learn how to succeed at work. The four E's and a P. Energy, this is resilience, we call it here. You keep going, no matter what, having a great upbeat attitude and good time and bad. Energizing others as opposed to tearing them down. Let's go, let's complete this assignment together. Yes, we're busy. Yes, something's happening at home, at work, whatever, but we're gonna push through. Edge, make a tough call, yes or no. Execute, just get it done, no excuses. Well, this, that, okay, never mind. Let's get it done. And finally, passion. Not hopping from here to there, doing different things all the time, but instead really going in and getting from the beginning of a project all the way to the end, instead of jumping around to different places. Critical. These areas, the four E's and the P, plus I wanna add collaboration. Collaboration is so essential. This is not a course where we're great on a curve, one person gets A plus, everyone else fails, no. Everyone can graduate. Everyone that works together does graduate. This is about us all coming together, especially in the fintech ecosystem. There's no, banks understand this, startups understand this. There's no way for them to do it alone. It's moving too fast, it's too complex. We need to connect, work together, and then we can succeed. Some folks come in and ask, well, what happens? You know, how come if the course is very tough, can I fail and so forth? Sure, people can fail, absolutely. Uh, but the, they, they are the ones who try to just do it on their own and you know that's it. Instead, if you come in, work with your professors, work with your teaching assistants, work with your colleagues in class, you'll succeed. You know, you'll more than succeed. You'll take this even further. So we do have comments from the course. You know, what is it like? It's a heavy workload, absolutely. Have people done this while they've had their own uh, jobs? Yes, people have done jobs as well as come through the course. But you're learning the domain of financial services and also the technology. So it's a lot of work. And we have expectations on your assignments. You don't have a good network, okay? Well, it's time for you to build that network. How's your LinkedIn look? How many people do you have? How many people know who you are? You don't know. Great, ask questions. Come on through with that. We have great sponsors too. UBS has hired more than 50 people from the program. And they said, uh, James Island, who comes in and speaks sometimes, uh, he's from the Evolve Innovation Center. He said, Singapore is our center for innovation. And for what? Global wealth management, investment banking, and more. So it's, it's great to be collaborating on the NUS FinTech SG program. And we have the startup, Razor, not such a small startup, but still, they said this is an exciting collaboration to be able to grow Singapore's digital economy. The leaders in these areas have come alongside the program and we work closely together with them so that you are in the right position. These are some of the other companies and this list keeps on changing, you know, adding more and more companies in that are working with us 
and certainly hiring people from this work. So I'll conclude here. We followed in AI Singapore's footsteps. AI Singapore is a great organization where you get to learn all about artificial intelligence. We said, we'd like to do something similar. They were three years ahead of us at, in US. And we said, let's go ahead and set up our FinTech SG program. We want it to be a way for you to get future proof because you're gonna learn skills that are in demand right now. We want the organizations to be able to hire talented people like yourselves potentially. And then ultimately to take Singapore to even higher heights as well. By the way, Singapore is not alone in this, in terms of the demand for talent. Countries all over the world are looking for, trying to bring in people from all over the world to do this type of work. That means that there's demand for these type of skills, not just in Singapore, but internationally. But what has COVID-19 shown us? You can work anywhere. From your desk, you can work. What does it also mean? Unfortunately, it means that people from anywhere can also work on things here. So the competition is not merely people that you're seeing on the screen here. In fact, those are your best collaborators. Your competition is outside of Singapore. They don't need to come to Singapore to work. They can do all the work from their desk, just like we are doing here on Zoom right now. The last thing I wanna mention is, that this isn't just about you. Glenn exemplifies this. What we shared with you this morning, this afternoon rather, and I hope that you'll take back to your friends, to family and say, look, I learned about this. There's a new opportunities here. I think it's a great place for us to get into. It's not just about you. If you come through this program, we're hoping that you will create five additional jobs so that people can follow behind you and work. Take Glenn, for example. He was a relationship manager and he worked and also took the FinTech SG program. Then he got hired as head of innovation at a peer-to-peer -peer lending company from relationship manager in a bank to head of innovation at a peer-to-peer -peer lending company, which is licensed by Monetary Authority of Singapore. And then he began to hire new people he hired people from FinTech SG. He created new jobs. He created new businesses. Awesome. And you can do it too. Glenn is a great guy. Also mid-career switcher like many of you may be. But like I said, if he can do it, I know that he would also tell you that you can too. So we have high expectations for those of you who can make it through our interview, make it through our assessment process and join into the program and also work your very hardest to make it through the entire FinTech SG program. We're here to support you. We're here to help you succeed. And we're here to look on as you go on to greater and higher success. Thanks a lot for listening.